Good afternoon. I'm Chad Bolser, campus president of the Richmond campus. And I'm Rebecca Ray Schulte, dean of the University and Transfer Division at Lawrenceburg. Chad and I are two members of the committee that worked on the organizational restructure project over the course of the last six months. I know you're eager to hear about the changes that are coming for Ivy Tech, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. But first, we wanted to provide some background on what brought us to today's discussion. When Sue Elsman was hired as Ivy Tech's new president last summer, she spent the month of June on a statewide listening tour. She wanted to hear directly from faculty and staff about Ivy Tech. She traveled to 22 different locations, visited every region, held 52 small group sessions, and met with more than 750 people. She heard some wonderful things about Ivy Tech, including the dedication and commitment of faculty and staff to student success. She also heard what wasn't working. Faculty and staff expressed frustration with the overall college structure, including the regional structure, regional consolidations, the role of central office, and a lack of clarity around a variety of roles. But most importantly, with the campus president's role. Sue clearly heard that Ivy Tech's organizational structure has created so much friction that it impacts how well we can educate and serve our students. It was clear based on feedback that Sue received last June that we could not wait until the completion of the strategic plan in December of 2017 to address these challenges in our organizational structure. What she heard is that something needs to be done now. Last fall, Sue directed the process improvement team to start the discovery process, a typical first step for any process improvement initiative. The first thing the process improvement team did was to conduct confidential interviews with over 200 regional faculty and staff. This included people from all campuses and regions, as well as central office. From those interviews, nine key challenges were identified. Role clarity, local empowerment, common language defining campus and site, state horizontal structure, accountability and metrics, regional lines and campus confusion, bi-regional decision clarity, clarity around divisions and programs, regional budgets and associated staffing levels. Once these nine key challenges were identified, a committee of regional faculty and staff was formed in late 2016. Committee members were identified by regional chancellors and included Chad and myself. The organizational restructure committee met from December to May to develop solutions to challenges presented by regional faculty and staff. Early in this work, benchmarking interviews were conducted with Lone Star College, Northern Virginia Community College, and the Communi Virginia Community College System, Maricopa Community Colleges, and Miami-Dade College. The committee used feedback from this benchmarking to inform their ideas. What was refreshing about this work was that there was no preconceived ideas about solutions. The only critical fact that wouldn't change was that Ivy Tech would remain a singly accredited college. From there, our committee was tasked with focusing on these nine key challenges and developing solutions using the Simplex process of creative problem solving. The proposed ideas came from regional representatives like us who were serving on the committee. From that larger committee, 13 initial ideas were offered, built upon and expanded to 25 for consideration. From those, four major concepts emerged, leading to four teams created and led by regional staff and faculty to hone in on selected ideas and build on those concepts. These four teams were structure and definitions, Role Clarity and Standardization, Structure for a Student's Life, Faculty Governance Model. Those four teams worked independently to build out concepts which were presented to the College Executive Council, 
led by President Elsterman, the Executive Council is composed of regional chancellors and the President's Cabinet. It's important to note that the Executive Council and the State Board of Trustees were updated regularly throughout this process. Each member of the committee and the State Board of Trustees signed confidentiality agreements. The intention of signing the agreements was to allow the process to work to its fullest potential without causing unnecessary anxiety. This also gave the committee the opportunity to thoroughly consider a variety of options during a compressed timeline. We know that there is still anxiety, and there will be throughout an organizational change like this, but keeping the details of the work confidential during that time was a necessary part of the process. And as members of the committee, we're proud of the difficult work our team tackled. And now, we're going to hand this over to President Elsterman to tell you about those changes. Thank you, Chad and Rebecca, for joining me today and for representing the Organizational Restructure Committee work. The task in front of this committee was significant, and the committee members did outstanding work. Thank you. I would cluster the restructure into three overarching focuses. One, putting more community in community college, something I heard often last summer. Two, placing more attention on students, that is our mission. And three, reducing friction across the system. By that I mean making it easier for all of us to work together, up, down, and sideways throughout our large organization. We will better serve students in our state as we align with community needs at the campus level and empower our campuses to be responsive and agile. Let me be clear also that we did not undertake the restructure to lay employees off or to close locations. There are no layoffs planned as a direct result of this new structure. However, I caveat that if enrollments continue to reduce, additional layoffs will be necessary and would be necessary under any structure. Further, though we are reclassifying some locations, none are slated for closing. This is important information we will provide to communities as we are committed to serving all of Indiana and believe to the greatest extent we are in the right communities. Our mantra should always be right program, right place, right size. So, how do these ideas take shape? First, we'll talk about the high-level changes, and then I'll share some specifics. And I want to reiterate something Chad and Rebecca said. There were no preconceived ideas about solutions for this organizational restructure project. Also, you were well represented by the committee of your peers that worked on this project for the last six months. They dug into the facts and data and cultivated a lot of ideas. Further, these ideas have continued to be shaped as more feedback has been received, up to and including this past week as we heard from regional cabinets. Be assured, we will continue to refine the structure as we learn together. There will be no regions as we know them today. This will eliminate the current bi-regional structure in effect in some areas of the state. The new focus will be centered on communities, and the locus of control is at the campus level. Campuses will be self-sustaining units with a chancellor as the executive in charge of one campus and its service area. As you know, today we have a bit of confusion about what is a campus, a site, and a secondary location. In the new structure, we will have large C1s, medium C2s, and small C3 campuses. We will also have large sites, S1s, and smaller sites, S2s. Finally, there will be secondary locations, which are really just additional buildings off the main campus, such as Lawrence, which provides health services for central Indiana, and Jeffersonville, which provides industrial technology for Sellersburg. The level was based on four primary criteria workforce demand and population of the service area, and enrollment and completions of the campus. Note, the first two recognize the needs of the community. The second two 
reflect the success of the campus in serving that community. Why does that matter? Staffing and in our 2018-2019 budget year, funding for campuses will be based on size, ensuring we are allocating our resources based on the community need and the campus success in enrollment and completion. We also believe this model will help campuses and sites set goals for how big they should or might become. For instance, a C2 could become a C1 if it grows enrollments and completions. Likewise, a C3 could become an S1 if enrollments or workforce needs continue to diminish. You can see on the map that there will now be eight C1s indicated by the green, five in the north, one in central Indiana, and two in southern Indiana. This reflects both our population centers of the state and the location of our sister institution, Vincennes University in southern Indiana. Just as we serve central Indiana with several locations, we are following where regional strategies exist, such as South Bend Elkhart, a new regional cities region, which has requested to be considered as one. You will also see Lake County pulling together Gary, East Chicago, and Crown Point into one campus structure, but with three locations as they serve Lake County. Over time, we will be open to morphing into quote unquote regions as appropriate, but not forcing them where they don't work, such as in the current by regional structure. Why? First, by focusing on campuses rather than regions, Ivy Tech campuses can connect to their local community in a way that is currently very difficult with the regional and bi-regional structure. In many cases, our regions were so large that leadership had to cover multiple geographic areas. Time and distance prevented them from developing those strong community connections. During my June listening tour, a nursing dean in one of the bi-regions expressed her concern about the chancellor and vice chancellors, saying she had watched the wear and tear on these individuals and was worried about their health. After watching the work life of bi-regional chancellors this year, I agree. As we dissolve bi-regions, we do it celebrating the extraordinary work of the chancellors, their leadership teams, and the faculty and staff who made those bi-regional models work. And we expect that where shared services were working, they are likely to continue in the future. More on that later. Second, Ivy Tech has not had a common definition of what constitutes a campus. This change will give us data-driven definitions of campuses and sites and define for faculty, staff, and students what services are available at each location. Changing to this campus-focused structure addresses most of those nine key challenges and sets the framework for addressing the remaining ones. Regarding strengthening academic structures, over the past few years, Ivy Tech has seen a lot of change related to our academic structure, including last year's directive from the Indiana General Assembly to develop alignment around Indiana's workforce needs. This follows on the heels of moving to academic divisions. We heard from you the need for clarity around academic divisions and programs. As such, the school structure will be reinstated from divisions. The divisions will move back into schools so programs can be better aligned. We will have, as you can see, School of Business, Logistics, and Supply Chain, School of Public Affairs and Social Services, School of Information Technology, School of Arts, Sciences and Education, School of Health Sciences, School of Nursing, and School of Advanced Manufacturing, Engineering, and Applied Technology. Our initial response from regional cabinet members has been overwhelmingly positive to this return to the past. It also aligns much more closely with Indiana's key industry sectors, which are manufacturing, healthcare, information technology, supply chain and logistics, and agriculture. Additionally, during Ivy Tech's last accreditation visit by the Higher Learning Commission, HLC identified that there wasn't a structure in place that would give faculty a voice 
to college leadership. A concern I also heard from many of you faculty and staff during my listening tour last June and an item of which I have committed to take action. The Organizational Restructure Committee should be commended for their work to develop faculty councils formed at the campus level to provide the opportunity for faculty members of all ranks to have a broader voice in academic policies, procedures, and strategy ownership. Additionally, there will be a statewide faculty council comprised of faculty council leads at each C1, C2, and C3. S1 and S2 faculty will participate with faculty councils at their corresponding C1 or C2 campus. And I should note the current curriculum committees will remain in place. The Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs position will focus on the student academic experience at the campus and include instruction and academic support responsibilities areas. These positions, no longer spanning by regions, will also represent the campus in a college-wide structure role. Regarding workforce alignment, most of the organizational restructure work has already taken place. It is important for the success of our campuses, students, and employers that we have a seamless approach of responding to and anticipating the needs of our communities and employers. The return to the school structure and serving Indiana's five key economic sectors addresses the bilateral structure we have around instruction and learning. These moves support students who are seeking to go directly into the workplace with their newly developed skills and knowledge, as well as the students who intend to transfer to one of our fine baccalaureate partners. The student affairs role will be split into student enrollment services and student support services. We call this the bifurcation of student affairs. There will be someone leading each of the two areas at C1 and C2 locations and combined positions at the C3 locations. Titles will be Vice Chancellor of Student Enrollment Services and Vice Chancellor of Student Support. Vice Chancellors of Student Affairs have done yeoman's work, but as we know, enrollment is down and retention is down, and we have a strong need to place additional focus in these two areas. The student enrollment services will be focused on recruiting new students, high school graduates, and working age adults, and ensuring our prospective students transition to Ivy Tech smoothly and are well prepared to start classes. The student support services will focus on ensuring students have the resources needed to successfully complete their chosen credential or degree. Too often, we look at our enrollment numbers and focus on recruiting, bringing in those new students, instead of placing equally important emphasis on our current students and ensuring they have the tools they need to complete courses and continue the next semester without stopping out. This change will allow the college to provide more attention to the services we provide students in these areas. Some additional details on the roles that will comprise each area. It's important to note that these are roles and not positions. In some cases, there may be multiple positions covering some roles, and in other cases, one position might encompass multiple roles. Areas with enrollment services are express enrollment, admissions and recruitment, K-12 enrollment recruitment and completion, financial aid, student records, bursar student accounts, and intake advising. Areas with student support services include wraparound services, career development, mentoring and coaching, student life, leadership and development, disability support services, Title IX and student discipline, and academic advising. You will see that two roles, the bursar student accounts and academic advising, have different colors. We are still considering their best home, if you will, as we complete detailed analysis of specific accountabilities and the best reporting relationship. I will discuss how that will happen in a few moments. Ivy Tech is a large system. As such, we gain economies of scale as we have done with our accreditation, with our LMS and marketing services. 
there are more services that may be put into that shared services or consolidated services model. These are being referred to as hubs. Hubs may be located at the systems office, which we currently call central office, or on a campus. For example, we already have Achieve Your Degree Backend Services Hub located on the Evansville campus. The priority list of what will be included in the shared services model is under development, but focuses on the non-student facing processes to allow the campuses to focus more easily and more effectively on student facing services. The Executive Council, including our chancellors, have helped to prioritize these services. Further work on the shared services hubs will follow the Ivy Lean process and projects will begin in the fall to consider each service individually. An important part of the Ivy Lean process inc is including campus level staff in the decision making process and implementation of this model will be thoughtful and deliberate. Efficiencies will be gained and any savings will be invested in campuses and systems office so that we can redeploy those dollars to student facing services such as wraparound services, recruiting, and expansion of high demand programs. The goal is not to decrease faculty or staffing, but to help Indiana achieve the goal of 60% of Indiana's workforce having a degree or credential by 2025. And Indiana cannot get there without Ivy Tech. The hub model addresses the need for local empowerment by moving common, non-student facing services that are currently standardized or could be standardized to a hub. This also provides clarity around roles, regional budgets, and associated staffing levels. Think of the hubs as a team of people ready to support the campuses in any area needed. A complex matrix organization like Ivy Tech requires some thoughtful, deliberate processes so employees within the organization are clear about who does what. We have a team in place to provide tools for establishing role clarity throughout the institution. One such communication tool we will deploy is called RACI. RACI is an acronym for Responsible, Accountable, Consult, and Inform. For every major function throughout the institution, a RACI chart will help define those levels and help people know how to communicate across the system. Who is responsible and accountable for a task? Who needs to be consulted before that task is carried out? And who needs to be informed about the task? Knowing the answers to these questions will help people understand their own roles and how they interact with others. This team will also work to recommend and implement other tools to further develop role clarity and to help employees at every level of the college understand how their job relates to others. This tool will particularly help us find the right home for those color-coded boxes I mentioned earlier in that, ca that campus organizational structure. As the role of chancellor spanning a large region or bi-region disappears, Ivy Tech will now split into three operational zones, North, Central, and South. A VP of Operations will be named for both the North and the South. Central will report to COO Dr. Andy Bound directly. This VP of Operations will support the chancellors in the restructure. Identify and encourage the sharing of best practices across campuses. Establish clear expectations of chancellors in student recruitment and retention and completions and fundraising and ensure all campuses are meeting the needs of students and communities. Note that the split in student affairs is not only on campuses, but will also happen at the systems office with the role of enrollment services being part of the Senior Vice President for Student Experience, Marketing and Communications team, and the role of student support being part of the Chief Operating Officers team. This is a sample of how the campus will reorganize once we have fully implemented this new organizational structure. So especially during the transition period, your campus organizational chart may look different than this one. Additionally, here we are only calling out the details in student and academic affairs, but everyone will be represented by the organizational chart. This structure will have an impact on our regional boards. 
The State Board of Trustees owns the responsibility and statute and will determine the final form, but remain committed to campus level, community-based external boards of trustees. Each of the 19 service areas will have a community-based board of trustees. Note, we do believe some of these areas will continue to morph as we respond to community needs. As I shared earlier, we should always respond to the needs of communities. This type of change is organic and customer responsive. There are some big changes and there are also some things that are still in process of being determined. We wanted to share these things with you now rather than waiting until every decision had been made because we felt it was time to share where we're headed and our timeline and give you a chance to ask questions. We also wanted to provide some assurances about the goals of this project. Again, this project is not aimed at reducing headcount or eliminating staff. Similarly, we are not going to add staff. This is not a budget reduction project, though we do anticipate cost savings over time with more efficient operations and growth in enrollment and completions. As we know this will be a concern, salaries will not be cut as a result of this organizational restructure. So anticipating some questions you may have. First, on budget. As you know, Ivy Tech operates on a July 1 to June 30 fiscal year, and decisions for the college's 2017-2018 budget have been made based on the regional structure currently in place. As you'll see in the timeline, we'll share in a moment our implementation plan that takes us through the next spring. Campuses will be operating under the current regional or re by regional budget, and the campus executives in those shared regions will make budget and personnel decisions to untangle and deploy as needed. If you've been sharing service with another campus, you may still continue to share those services. For example, two regions are currently merged and share multiple leadership positions. Once the campus chancellors are confirmed, campus chancellors will get together and figure out how to uncouple over the course of this fiscal year, but the shared positions may remain intact during some or all of that period. Also recognize that changing our internal organizational structure has an impact externally. We have been discussing these changes with the Higher Learning Commission, and at this time, they see no concerns with us moving forward. With our reaccreditation coming in 28, 2019, we will continue to keep HLC apprised of these changes. So, now for the timeline. Naming of campus chan chancellors will be the next step in implementing this new organizational structure. That work has already started, and those decisions will be finalized by August 1st. The campus chancellors will then begin forming their campus cabinet, with that being finalized by October the 1st. The RACI model will also be finalized by October 1st with standardized job descriptions for campus level positions. We have received many questions about why are we doing this before the strategic plan is completed? And that is such a good question. Many regions indicated urgency around that bi-regional structure in my listening tour last summer, and all regions indicated anxiety around the current structure in those 200 interviews that took place last fall. The strategic planning process began in February and won't be finalized until December of this year. Due to the urgency around the structural concerns, the decision was made not to wait and to work on both projects in tandem. Both initiatives are being led by the same senior team and information has been shared across both projects. For example, the organizational restructure team received regular updates on the feedback from the strategic planning process. As we develop goals for the strategic plan, we are mindful of the nine original concerns of this project and we will ensure as a leadership team that the strategic plan also addresses these issues. I am sure you will have more questions. If you're watching this on campus, we have facilitators ready to capture those questions and your feedback. We have, if you're watching elsewhere, we'll be sending an all college email that will include a link to submit questions. Then, on Monday from 1 to 2 p.m., I'll be here again, joined by our Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Andy Bound, to answer as many questions as we can. Keep in mind, we likely will not have all the answers to those questions, 
that you have, but we will answer as many as we can. I want to conclude by thanking the Organizational Restructure Committee for their work over the past seven months. We gave them a monumental task and an aggressive timeline. We have 18 of Ivy Tech's finest people representing all of our current regions and functional areas. Thank you, Chad and Rebecca, for representing the committee today and to the entire team for coming together, stepping forward to represent your region, your faculty and staff, and making these recommendations. It's been a privilege to be a part of this committee. Um, we had representation from all 14 regions and all functional areas, and the task wasn't easy, but we definitely welcomed the opportunity to help shape the future of Ivy Tech. I also want to thank the State Board of Trustees for their support and guidance during this time of change for Ivy Tech and always being mindful of the big picture, which is to serve the people of the state of Indiana. Ivy Tech family, thank you for your attention today and for your unwavering commitment to making Indiana a great place to live, to learn, and to work. We know that these changes will help us put the community back in community college and ensure Ivy Tech is structured to serve Indiana students, communities, and employers for the next decade. Thank you.